Well, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank the Methodist Church, particularly Reverend Khan, who's here this evening, okay, for allowing us the use of the church. Uh, some people who have helped out along the way, Jim V. and Beaver did a lot of the, uh, helped me with the research. Uh, Jeff Henry helped, uh, Penny LaCroix, Paul McMillan um, added some of the things, put up the sign that you see out there. Um, Richie McLaughlin, um, where's Rich? He's hiding, he doesn't like to be in the spotlight, I know. But Richie, uh, Richie and I uh, spent several days together. I've become close, he's been like my brother. We've been arguing like brothers anyways, I can tell you that. Um, but I want to thank those people and anyone else. Uh, Diane and John Haley also contributed some pictures and I'm sure I'm gonna miss someone along the way. Uh, this is Andrew Sylvia here from Westford Cable Access TV. Andrew, uh, you've probably seen or heard him one time or another. This is going to be taped for cable TV. So, with that, let me get started. This is about Graniteville. Two quick questions. Who can tell me the name of Graniteville before it was Graniteville? No, it wasn't S H I T. I heard that. <laughs> you forge people are all alike, Mickey. Jeez. <laughs> Stone quarry, stone quarry. Thanks. The other one. What did the what did the Grenfell have in uh, common with uh, the Beatles? That's correct. The original name for the Beatles were the Quarrymen. Thank you. You win an all expense paid tour and a free trip to the museum. Any Sunday you want, two to four. Bring several people with you. We got a little thing you can contribute when you leave. Anyways, let me refer first to Hodgman's history of the town of Westford that was done in 1883. If you haven't got one of these, you really should. And there, there's plenty of them available up at the, uh, up at the museum. Um, Hodgman wrote his history in 1883, and I know there's a few people working on an update to this. But, he says this village owes its existence to the water power and the building of the railroad in 1847. Yeah. So, as I said, it, Grateful owes its existence uh, to the building of the railroad in 1847. And the railroad actually opened in July of 1848. But not only Grantville, but Forge Village as well owes its existence to uh, the coming of the railroad, the Stony Brook Railroad that was built from uh, Groton Junction, which is known as Air today, and ran into Lowell. And with the coming of the railroad, um, these, it, both these areas became more appealing to the industrial people, uh, particularly those in the, um, in, in the uh, field of, uh, of, of, of materials, uh, uh, cloth materials, so. It grew up, Grantville grew up along the banks of the Stony Brook River, okay, with the sloping hills to the north. You can see the sloping hills. You've probably seen this print at one time or another. These are the quarries, set the quarries. This is the mill pond, and you can see the dense area over here was where the village was settled. I'm going to show a few maps as we go along. I need, I need to stay on this slide the whole night. Okay. <laughs> Can you move it in? There we go. All right, this is a Grantiful Street Directory in 1903, which goes to show um, how the village grew. Here's an interesting one. West Street, Cowdery Hill, to Groton Road at the house of E.J. Wood. That was Cowdery Hill Road. We know Cowdery Hill does not go all the way through today. But it's interesting how they, they um, laid these houses out. From Greg's Corner, H.D. Wright's house, you go past H.D. Wright's house, to the Groton Road, and that was North Street, the same as it is today, Greg's Corner, by the depot, Catholic Church, to Reed's Brook, and that was Main Street, now known as North Main Street. And uh, as I said, Broadway Street, River Street, and these were, most of the, uh, the town meeting of 1903 was the one that named many of the roads in town. So this is the street directory from there. Okay, Dave. Okay, when I talk about the early history, 
talk about three distinct periods. The contact period, which run from 1500 to 1620, the colonial period from 1620 to 1775, usually considered the outset of the American Revolution. Uh, the federal and the pre-industrial period runs from about 1775 to 1854. And let me tell you, when you look at Graniteville during that period of time, there's not an awful lot going on. Um, the speaking, the Algonquin Indians, speaking Wamaset, Pawtucket, and Nashoba tribes, actually inherited the area between the Merrimack Rivers and the Concord Rivers. There's evidence of scattered uh, hunting activity throughout there. Um, you can, they used the Stony Brook for fishing. The, um, they, there was a fish weir in Forge Village that was bought, uh, it was, that was where Andrew the Indian um, actually turned over the land in Forge Village to the Prescotts back in around 1680. So mainly it was used for transportation, the Stony Brook at the time. But it was basically a hinterland. Westford begins to grow when a road is built from Groton to Chumpsford. And it goes through Forge Village and up actually down through Parker Village, okay, and with an extension that goes off into West Chumpsford. And so you began to see growth along that area, but not much is going on in the Graniteville area. During the federal and pre-industrial period, 1620, 1775, if you look on in the inside of the cover of this booklet, this is a book, Hodgman's, and it's a 1730 map, and if you ever see, this looks like there's a lot of roads, but there really isn't, okay? When I look at this, I see two residences. One, the name is Fletcher, and the other name is Wright. Two very, very <laughs> common names in Westford. The uh, Fletcher land was on North Street, and the Wright uh, property was what we know as the Lion's House, which is right at the corner uh, by, well, and I'm going to show you a picture of that later on. So there's not an awful lot that goes on here, in terms of, uh, of, of growth, it's, it's when the railroad comes through, once again, when the railroad comes through here, and this is the railroad, the things really start picking up, okay? This is Snake Meadow Hill. This is where much of the quarrying activity is going to go on. And in this map, you can see it says stone quarry right there. It was a small quarry, okay? Number 10. Schoolhouse number 10, built in 1851. Okay. 1851, there were 10 different school districts within uh, the town. Time. These are elementary schools, uh, I should say elementary schools, grades, that they would take grades one through eight. All right? Jeff, what, what's the hash mark line going sort of east-west across the lower heart part of the Rattlesnake Hill there? The lower part of Rattlesnake Hill. This is Kissacook. Uh, Snake Meadow. Snake Meadow? Snake Meadow Hill. Yeah, Snake Meadow. Snake Meadow Hill. What's that hash line going? Into it's a good question, and I'm not sure whether that is just simply a um, <laughs> simply if, if you get the blown up map, it might show uh, some kind of a a. Um, I think it's an attempt to show the degree of elevation and slope. Yeah, it may be something to that effect. Yeah. But I'm not sure. It's not. It, it is not a railway. It's not anything like that, so or a roadway. The town border. Right? No, That's not no. A As a matter of fact, this today. If you look at this, here's a machine shop. This is what we've known as North Street. Okay. Uh, once again, this is B Wright. It's property here, and up here. Once again, where the Lions House is. That's also. Keep in mind this one here. All right. And because. Later on, I'm going to be showing you, many of you who are familiar with Graniteville have seen the root cellar, or been down by the root cellar. I don't know if Wright built that root cellar, but it's about the location of where that root cellar would be. Okay? Okay, Stony Brook Railroad is built in 1848 with a stop in Graniteville. The railroad was built to connect manufacturing centers in Groton Junction, as I said. Okay? And, um... The decision, it was with this decision, if you go to the next one, Dave, is that Calvert and Sargent move into Westford. This is where they were located in Lowell. This building is on Fletcher Street. Roger, my brother. Whereabouts is Fletcher Street? Fletcher Street. Do you remember where the old Cody's Paint building is? 
Yeah. Okay. So that building is where the original Calvert and Sargent's <coughs> was located. Okay, in Lowell. They moved out here. What brought them out here? Well, the railroad. Now they could transport. They had, uh, with uh, the buying of the mill, by, where the machine shop was, they were able to set up. They could transport their goods along the railroad. Okay? Quarries and manufacturing. Graniteville grew up around manufacturing facilities and the quarries. This was an at map from 1856, and it says Stone Quarry Village. Okay? Once again, this is Nost Street, shows B Wright. Schoolhouse number nine was what we know as the Lions of Wright Schoolhouse on Groton Road. Forge Village is located here. Now, this is the 1856 map. It's around this time that, uh, that C.G. Sargent actually is the influential person in changing the name from Stone Quarry Village to Graniteville. All right, quarries. Quarries came into existence. It, it says the latter part of the 19th century. That's incorrect. It came into business in the latter part of the 18th century as a distinct business but they were, what they were doing at the time was using large, isolated rocks, many of them that were brought through uh, as a result of the glaciers. Um, the, uh, I know that the, the, the post in, in um, uh, was it uh, Faneuil Hall, that area, mm -hmm. came from quarrying that was done here in Westford. I believe those, that rock was found up uh, closer towards present-day Fletcher's Quarry. Okay. Benjamin Palmer. Arrives here about 1847, comes down from Maine and sets up his business. And these, I got the four major quarries, and then I put others. So if you show that, okay. Palmer's, started 1847, some of the trucks. If you grew up in Graniteville or Forge, that might look familiar to you, okay? This is where we spent our summers back in the 40s, the 50s, and into the 60s along that rock that was known as Boulder Beach. Is that okay? Hall in there? What's that? Is that Ruth Hall in there? No. <laughs> Actually, this was uh, from the Thomas Shoes collection. Oh. Okay? So it was taken in 1942, which surprised me because I didn't think they were swimming up there yeah, at were. that time. Yeah, yeah, but I found out Paul McMillan was telling me his mom swam there. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, and it kind of died out after that um, in, in the, by the 60s and into the 70s and whatnot. So, but, but that familiar rock area, okay, was all part of her. Next one, Reed's Quarry. Reed's Quarry, there were two Reed's. There was William Reed and there was um, his brother David. William Reed bought 61 acres on Snake Meadow Hill along with his brother in 1855. Once again, this is familiar. If you can see, this is Graniteville Woods. All right? Richie, Craw uh, Richie um, McLaughlin and I took a walk up to here last fall. And, you know, we got some pictures um, of the area. I was just amazed at how close this quarry was and how easy access it has through Graniteville Woods. These can go right out in their backyard, and there it is. Um, we, have, we have several different pictures we could have shown you. There's one that says Crocker on the rocks, okay? I don't know who put that there, Mickey, but, uh, but as you can see, this, this, was, this was also a very, uh, very famous swimming hole back in the 50s and the 60s as well. And there was people who actually dived off that cliff there, yeah? Okay? Reach Quarry. We knew it as Hilda's Quarry. And it became Hilda's Quarry because one of the Reeds, or the Reeds' daughter, married a Hildreth, and he took over the operation. And it was in existence until around 1930. Okay. Um, that's, this is Willard Reeds' Quarry. His brother David moved and had a, another operation on um, Cowdery, uh, closer to Cowdery Hill. I came in through the... Uh, if you come in through the Route 40 side, where Cowdery Hill is located, 
I took a hike um, with Frank Carcota. Some of you may know Frank. He's lived in that area and goes up through the woods all the time. But he said, it would take us about an hour, and it was a three-hour tour. And, I, <laughs> and I'll tell you, I felt that we were done. But, but he showed me the many, many different quarries up there, and particularly one that probably was uh, David Reed's quarry, because there's a large, large uh, ledge there as well. Okay. Yep. Can tell you there were two brothers, all his lawn, and that was where Lord Haley set out. Yes, there was, a, there was, as I said, if you hit the next one, okay, there were other quarries, okay? There were other quarries. There was, a, uh, from uh, one of the uh, journals showed Couture had a quarry on Cowdery Hill Road. The Bonds, okay? Yeah. There was also, I don't know, if, how, what, what you, you can make straight me out as this, Reverend, but there was a ministry lot up there, about 20 acres. Okay, and apparently the, whatever they got from that went to the church at the time. And that was in existence. I read that in Hodgman's, uh, Hodgman's history as well. Okay, Acer and Almond Bond, yes. They had two brothers that had it. Couture Quarry there in 1906 as well. And the last one is the Hammett Wright Quarry. How would you get to the Hammett Wright Quarry? The access was off of North Street. If you went up the hill, um, as you were headed towards the highway garage today, okay, and you got to the highway garage and walked to the back of that, you'd see a ledge. And that was Hammett's Wright's quarry, stone quarry. This is from 1899. All right? That's the one, if you go to the museum and look uh, at the display, there are a lot of names. Uh, Norman Samad, for example. If you were from Granite, we all, we all knew Norman. Uh, Eddie Beebe. 1932. His name is up there, Chippy Nida. I mean, these are all stars from Graniteville over the years. So. Okay? Hammett Wright. Hammett Wright, uh, Hammett Wright actually owned the house. If you, the entrance going up towards the uh, highway garage where the Hillmans just sold that house, that was Hammett Wright's house. Okay? But he was born in a house down the street across from where Kittner's um, nursery is. Okay, mm -hmm. the house directly across from that was where Hammett Wright was born. And if you're looking for Hammett Wright today, David, there he is. <laughs> okay, and they'll found, next one, in the Wright Cemetery. Yeah. Okay, now I don't, if you're not familiar, this is as you go around that corner on, uh, off of North Street and down Rotten Road, um, this is on the left hand side, the Wright Cemetery. Oh, yeah. Okay, the Wright Cemetery, and uh, mostly all rights. There, there is. Uh, there are a few other people. Um, the ghouls are in there as well. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, if you know Bob Herman, Bob Herman. I know his parents are, are buried there as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, interesting. One of the interesting facts well, across from this cemetery, uh, if you if you have the opportunity to read. Uh, the Westford Recollections it was a, a group of uh, interviews that um, June Kennedy did around uh, the bicentennial year. But she interviewed Bernice Picking, and Bernice talked about a church that was directly across or in the area of the cemetery. I never knew about it. It was probably where the old oil tanks were that we remember up there, um, but in that location. So, okay. Those are the quarries. The businesses, well, the three significant major businesses, of course, were Abbott and Company. Okay, and you can see Abbott and Company, Worcester Mills, and Graniteville, and that's the uh, sketch that comes from uh, uh, Hodgman's book also. And there's C.G. Sargent's. The building was built in 1877, and that's from 1900. And then there were the Haley's, okay? Uh, the Haley's were the smartest. They survived all these years, right? <laughs> And uh, but we're going to go into a little more. I, you know, uh, one of the things in putting this together, I say, do I go into a large explanation of what they did at Abbott's and what they did at Sargent's? And I'm just not going to do that. It just isn't the time. You could spend an hour on the history of this church alone. Um, and we just haven't got the, for, the, for this presentation, we haven't got the time to do it. But we've got plenty of material for those people that want to explore further. And I'd be happy to direct you towards any of that stuff. So, okay. Okay, 
We now look at the early industrial period, and this map that I'm going to be referring to from time to time is known as the Walker map. It's from 1899, okay, from 1899. What you see here is the changes in transportation during this period of time. Now remember, you now have sergeants, you now have abbots, and you have quarries that are beginning to flourish. So you have the Stony Brook Railroad, this railroad here, but another one called the At Nashua and Acton in Boston and Maine Railroad that ran here, better known as the Red Line. Why the Red Line? Didn't make any money, okay? <laughs> Drew, you know? And I think a lot of people confuse it when they, when they built the Red Line Junction after they threw down the Caliente up on Route 40, okay? <laughs> Well, they, they named it after this particular line, but they thought the line ran through it. It was actually the old trolley line that they were Wasn't referring the to. Line? Huh? The blue line. Blue, it could have been the blue line. Yeah. The yeah. Line yeah. The yeah. But this was, uh, it, it ran, it, it, I was told at one time, part of the reason was, there was really not an awful lot to transport this way. Mm -hmm. Okay? Everything else, the other trains were going into Lowell and then into Boston. If you were going from Nashua to Acton, uh, you know, it really didn't, didn't take any. So that's part of the reason it failed. It, the, it's famous today for the Arch Bridge, okay, which was built. Okay? And you begin to see the development also of the different roadways. And this shows you all the different houses in and around the Greenville area. Okay? Yep, next one. Okay, this is the West Grantiful Station, would have been located in St. Catherine's parking lot. Okay, the West Grantiful Station, situated on the present day parking lot of St. Catherine's. There's, there's actually two of them. One's a uh, freight station and the other one is for passengers. Okay. By the way, uh, that building, okay, was moved if you're standing in the church and you look to your left, that would be 98 North Main Street, and that's the old West Granifal Station. Okay, that's the old West Granifal Station. It certainly has been built on, just like the Pine Ridge Station, if you go to where Forge Village Road crosses over uh, Cold Spring Road, you're headed towards Western Academy, you see a building, that's the old Pine Ridge Station that was moved across the street, and it looks like a train station. When you look at it, you go, yeah, that's a train yeah. station. Yeah. And you can actually see the, you know, some of the results. I come to learn, um, I was with Paul, Paul McMillan's here. Yeah, Paul. Paul was telling me um, that uh, he said, well, that house burnt. Burnt in 1932. His mother was a Cody at the time. They were living there. Uh, tragically, his mother, fortunately, uh, survived. But she, she lost her brother and sister and uh, a neighbor, correct? All, we all died in that fire. So... Fires were much more common as well. This is the Granifal Station, okay, around 1900. Okay, this would have been located across from the funeral parlor. Today, what we know is the funeral parlor, okay? If you see, if you, if you drive down by there, you can see some granite uh, pieces that, that are out there. I thought they were part of the foundation, but I was told by uh, Roddy Palmer, who's a descendant of the Palmers, that they, actually those were part used to, um, I guess, as a hoist for loading granite on to uh, the uh, trains they went through. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Charles Sargent. Came to Graniteville from Lowell in 1854 to begin his business venture with his partner Francis Calvert. Together they created Sargent and Calvert's, the business manufacturer machinery for wood and cotton mills, woolen and cotton mills a new industrial industry, and they were growing up. That's what Lowell grew up around, Lawrence grew up around, uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, the textile mills. Sargent would go on to buy Calvert Shear in the business, making Sargent and Calvert a Sargent family business. And later, his involvement with his two sons in the business, they renamed it C.G. Sargent and Sons. Over the years, the names changed, uh, but the Sargent uh, connection to the town remained very strong. This is Charles Sargent. C.G. Sargent also was a, 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 contributed, I think, $2,000 originally to the founding of this church. Okay, next one. 
became well known in the Westford due to his active involvement in the Westford community. According to the 1875 tax listings, he was the wealthiest man in Westford, which came with an influence he used to improve the town in many ways. He developed Graniteville as a residential village when he bought land around his mills for the uh, worker housing in the style of many of the industrial villages. The same sort of thing was done in Forge Village. Abbott invested money on, we'll say, Bradford Pond Street to build um, houses. My house on Pershing Street was built by Abbott's. As previously mentioned, his other activities when the town included Board of Trustees for Westford Academy, his membership and influence in the community and the Methodist Church in Graniteville. Samuel Fletcher. Samuel Fletcher built this house. Actually, uh, if you are familiar with uh, uh, on Hillside Avenue, they moved the house that um, Lois Jewett lived in, those, and um, that was originally on the site. This is the present day funeral parlor. Okay, Samuel Fletcher, the owner of the quarry, lived here. This was taken around 1900. This was 1943, I believe, is when they had the auction. And you can see it's much more run down at the time. And there's a couple of other pictures we had showing the auctioneer actually auctioning off the contents, it was built, it was uh, bought this time by Jimmy Healy, I believe, John, where's John? Uh, Arthur would have bought it at this time, in 43 or 46? Am I correct? Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, okay. And you can see the cars. Okay, the next one, um, William Reed, as you get on, this is 67 North Main Street, William Reed, who was uh, also owned the smaller house down at the bottom of the hill. Um, but this house, uh, was uh, he was the owner of the quarries. It later went to Harrington. Uh, 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 Harrington was one of the major builders in Westford, in the Graniteville area. Okay. Okay, and at least nine company houses were built, mainly duplexes at the time. And this is a scene of the village. And you can see, this is from around 1900 as well, and you can see the area really starting to grow around the mill pond. Next one, Dave. Uh, you know, I, uh, probably this was taken, um, I would say, from probably the upstairs of your house, Chet, right? I would say, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, now we get into the industrial period. Uh, well, specifically, the industrial period 1877 through 1910 is when things re begin to take off, not just here, but in the United States um, as a whole. Uh, the Industrial Revolution in American history is usually seen from 1870 to about 1910. And this is when we begin to see also new immigration. We talk about old immigration up to about 1870. Old immigration would have been from Northern Europe, I said the Swedes, the Irish, okay? But now you begin to see um, people coming in from southern um, Europe and eastern Europe, okay? Polish, Russian, Greeks, Italians, all right? And Catholics, okay? Many more Catholics. Well, they built a Methodist church. And when they built the Methodist church here, they talked about which church they want. Well, they talked about Baptists and Congregationalists, but they decided on a Methodist church uh, when, they, when they did build it, but they never talked about a Catholic church at the time. They just weren't enough Catholics. So, next one, Dave. Okay. Um, getting ahead of myself here. Okay, the residents of the district evolved uh, during the mid-19th century for mainly native-born group and one of significant foreign-born population, okay? Catholic residents became significant number and they began to uh, uh, visit pastors from St. Patrick's Church, Americanization, and um, education classes were a priority for the immigrants, okay? And I'm jumping ahead here. Excuse me, I gotta find my location. Okay, an industrial period. The industrial period, 1970-1910, it's a prosperous time. Abbott purchases the Horse Nail Company, okay? What is this today? This would be the Abbott Mills, 
okay, the Abbott Mills, the Abbott Apartments that we know in Forge Village. This, was pro this picture was probably taken from the parking lot across from um, we know as the village store. But that was, that was the horse nail company. When the railroad came through in 1848, you begin, they, they set up what was known as the uh, Westford uh, Manufacturing Company in Forge Village. That was in existence through about 1865, and then the Horse Nail Company, which was in existence until 1877. When they went out of business, Abbott saw an opportunity, said, we're going to move our operation, some of our operation, and moved into this building, and eventually tore this down and built the uh, structure that you see there today. Okay. Stony Brook Railway, all right? Uh, if you wanted the pizza today, that's where you'd get it, okay? <laughs> but this was, uh, this was originally Splane's store in Forge Village. We just put this up to show the, uh, the trolley ran behind there and down um, along. This would be in front of, you know, Chet, this would be in front of your house, Chet, Cook, okay, down. And down, uh, actually down Beacon Street, uh, across Nutting Road, that road you see going into the old highway garage was uh, actually the line for the, um, for the trolley. And that was there until 1921. Okay. okay, the population. You begin to see the population begins to change. More, as I said, more Europeans coming in. Um, by 1910, report shows Different trend, only 15 of the 50 newlyweds that year were born in the country, much less, okay. They came from in Germany, Italy, England, and Australia. Above, Wasso Belita, Alexander Sakovich, okay. And I can't say, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the rest. <laughs> That's only because I can't read them. A, where's Patty Biscello? Patty, you here? I have you read them, Patty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With the road, which says the Russian cemetery, the Russian yeah. Polish cemetery on Patton Road. Why a specific cemetery? Well, because that large population, and they, there's some kind of a, a fellowship or something like that. They still maintain it, don't they? Yeah. yeah. They still maintain yeah. that area. Yeah. 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 I've been meaning to pick those up. No, I gave them one and they wanted the one. And I kept one, but I do have to bring Yeah. And it's interesting, the Grodno store, which I'm going to show you a picture of a little later, but the Grodno store was the entrance going into Beacon Street, you know. And there were two. That was Grodno 2. Grodno 1 was um, on Pond Street, okay? And that building still exists today. So now, right cool. at the beginning of Beacon Street, there was a pharmacy at one time. Is that correct? In the beginning of Beacon Street? Yeah. That was a grotto. And, and I heard this, like in 1900 or so, there was a murder in the basement or something? I think it was around 1930, and I heard that. I don't have that story, but there is, uh, I thought around 1930, and I'll tell you who helped me with that was Willis Buckingham. I don't know if you know. Mm -hmm. Willis, 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 we drove around with Willis last year, and he pointed out some things and mentioned that. So, okay? Catholics, residents became numerous, so they built the church in 1892. I got two pictures, because this was probably an early picture from around 1900. This is from a postcard. And look at the difference. Okay? So there's a major difference you can also see to the left here, um, which would have been the train station. Okay? Train station. So this is, this is the original St. Catherine's Church, the original built in 1892, uh, in the, which would have been located in the parking lot across from present-day St. Catharines. Present-day St. Catharines was constructed in 1934 and expanded on later on. Okay. Commercial establishments. Okay, John A. Healy, um, which would have been great-great-great-grandfather John? Uh, Great grandfather, okay. Was born in Canada in 1855, moved to Granville around 1875. He worked for the Abbott Wisted Company 
1885, he started Coal, Wood, and Livery Stable. Later in 1905, he established J.A. Haley and Sons. I wouldn't call it funeral home, but he went into the funeral business. Okay? Correct me if I'm wrong on these, John, okay? Later, the Coal and Coke Company that became the current J.A. Haley Oil and Fuel Company. He also operated a company that performed excavation, landscaping, and related tax tests. He dug trenches for the town water system, excavated foundations and holes and landscape yards for company-owned apartments. Okay, this is him on the uh, fire apparatus in the early part of the 1900s because the original fire station was located in that barn as well. Okay, next one. All right. They also did work, uh, this is uh, carrying some of the washers uh, that would have been CG sergeants, okay? And as you can see at the top here, it says livery stable. All right, next one. And there's John, <laughs> his mother and father, standing in front of the bench they contributed for the 120th anniversary of J.A. Healy's. J. Healy and Sons Heating Oils, it looks today. Uh, it also has a history. I saw a few of my old friends, Dennis Mulligan, Jimmy Van Beaver. We spent some time in that basement there, right? Oh. <laughs> it was known as the hole. <laughs> and that's where we hung out until Johnny's father had had enough of us and said, get out. <laughs> okay, at uh, 1889, Bemis and Wright on North Main Street. This store here, okay, once again located at that same location that the, uh, the monument is today, um, uh, where the original Abbott Worcester Company was. There were other stores. Uh, the AG started was on 2nd Street, and this would be the house directly across from the Sergeant School. Uh, it was uh, it was AG started store. Uh, there were also three grocers, one fruit and cheese store, a miller and a blacksmith, a provision store, several peddlers and um, dressmakers during this period of time also. The next one. Okay. Now we get into the modern period. Modern period. The automobile replaces the trolley, which ceased its operation. <laughs> Tracks were removed from Main Street and Beacon Street in 1930. Now, the story behind this, very briefly, John, uh, on June 17th, Emma May Wright, once again, a right, who lived at 40 North Street, was a passenger in a 1920 Model T driven by a nurse companion, Mrs. Emma Weeks. Coming easily on Broadway, they attempted to make a right-hand turn on the bridge. She failed to straighten it out, which resulted in an apparent U-turn almost over the bridge. <laughs> Family tradition says they were trapped in the vehicle for a considerable period while they watched two Boston Maine fast freights beneath them. It was eventually, the car was eventually hauled across River Street to Furbish's garage, which we knew was Nami Nesmus and, okay, Bob Herman's later on. I'll show you a picture of that later. But you received a bill for repairs, 4720, and a bill from Boston made for 7156 to repair the fence. Okay. CG Sargents begins to expand its operations. Um, we're only getting a negative at this, but this is actually bread, okay? So they're into uh, making bread at the same time, get into food other than just the, uh, the dryers they were making for textiles at the time, okay? Many small family businesses operated the village during this early part of the 20th century, okay? First National Store, you can't read it as well, but it says the manager was John Tandis and the clerk was Jackie Cornell who was our town council for years. Walter N. Fletcher, uh, Jeans Variety Store, Furbish's Motor Sales, Nick Sudak, Healy's Market. Any idea? I didn't, that was one to me, John, that I hadn't seen before. Okay. Uh, Clover Farm Store, okay, or George Reeves, Brunel's Market, Johnny's Variety Store, and I'm gonna show you some pictures as we go through. It's not rolling through them, Dave. Okay, first national store. Okay, we know his parents market. This, this, the, the, this picture here uh, was one taken by Barbara Peacock, one of her first pictures when she got into photography in 1982. 
And of course, that is the first national store probably in the late 1930s. Same buildings, same location, not the same buildings. I love a country club. You can actually get a membership to the Idle Hour. <laughs> and I'm sure there were wives who were unhappy about this, believe me. <laughs> Let me give you a little background. Idle Hour Country Club. This is Bob. Uh, thank you, Bob uh, Oliphant. I'm using your gazetteer. It was originally the Idle Hour Club Incorporated, referred to as just the Idle Hour. It was a neighborhood bar located at 81st Street. Is now uh, it was it was started. Conrad Richards operated Richards, yeah, okay. Operated the grocery store there as early as 1915. It was granted the license for two pool tables and three bowling alleys on First Street. Okay, in 1920 it probably was the start of the Idle Hour. Conrad and Anna Richards operated uh, the bowling alley and pool hall. In 1931 renamed it the Idle Hour. By 1941. After the divorce, Anna married Leopold A. Kupel, Leo Kupel, Kupel, Kupel. Kupel yeah, 1948. Leonard L Thibodeau operated the Idle Hour, and then from 1949, uh, Frederick and Emily Hosmer, Horner, Horner right, Horner, and then it was, it was bought by Frankie Balancer, Balancer. Louis Balancer. Can we talk about the weddings that were there? No, yeah, and you know, once again, this was, this was the place to go. I mean, if you were going to have a wedding, it was the Idle Hour, upstairs of the Idle Hour. It, was, it, be, it would, went from the bowling alley, a neighborhood bar, but it was also the place to be. It was well known, okay? And in the 1980s, it became a hangout for uh, the Hells Angels. Actually, because they were, they were situated on River Street. But I mean, it did. It was demolished in 1998. This membership card, and that's a picture of the Idle Hour. Okay? There were a lot of different stores throughout Graniteville. Two of them, this is the Grodno. Okay, that's the Grodno, the one you were talking about. Yep. If you went down, this is 51, uh, just before you turn into Maple Street. That was obviously a, a candy store at one time. But, I mean, if you went all up and down um, uh, Broadway, uh, I, I, I learned, for example, there was a bakery located there. Okay, where um, with, with actually where the togs lived. Okay, in the basement there was a bakery and there was a fish market there at one time on that same road. Keep going, Dan. Okay, this is 4 4th Street. Okay, house, but this was a store at one time. I asked Jack Cornell and Jack told me it was uh, a green that ran it at the time. So, next one over. Okay, 3rd Street, there was, check this out, ice cream parlor, 3rd Street. Sunday, May 14th, each lady presents this card, gets an ice cream, and each gentleman gets a cigar. Okay? Lewis Lang taught, incidentally, at the corner uh, is the uh, memorial for his, uh, uh, probably his son, uh, Napoleon, who was killed in World War I. Next to it, was there a building, Paul, you said Johnny's Variety? Was it was probably a building that was next to what Bruley, we knew as Bruley's? Okay, so all in the same building, all right, all in the same building. Here was a cobbler by the name of Dumont, and this would be the house directly across on 3rd Street, and there's a little building in back that is actually a, a residence today, but that's where I believe the cobbler shop was. Next one. Okay, Holmes's Barbershop and Variety Store on 2nd Street. Holmes's owned by the Duttons. This is Jeanette Holmes. Okay. Okay. Next one. Okay. Once again, this is this is economy grocery stores. I don't know when this picture. Probably in the late 1930s. But this one says ice cream. Okay. And this would have been Jackie, in the house where you you grew up, right? Yeah. Yeah. Grandmother's shop. Where the garages now. Yeah, where the garages, and they sold ice cream out of the ice cream and candy. Lending library. Lending library, okay. Yeah. Okay. Furbish's Garage uh, at the end of Broadway. 
This is a crane that's working, but you can see Furbish's garage in the background. You can see there's actually two things here, and this is a parade in the 1930s. Furbish's motor sales, is that what that says? Okay, Frank Furbish, very prominent uh, gentleman, uh, very prominent in, in town politics during the 1920s and 1930s as well. Okay. Architects of the Sergeant Foundries, okay. The Sergeant Foundries, where's Andy Bergamini? Andy, what did they do with the foundry? They made uh, gray iron castings. It was a Ford metal. Uh, gray iron gets its name from its color. Okay. And it's uh, because of the silica in the, in the iron. And uh, they used to make anything that metal, cast iron, is good for anything that requires rigidity as opposed to flexibility. Okay. So they made uh, huge margin iron, marginizers for oil companies. Uh, they made huge, huge valves. If, if you ever see uh, action pictures where guys are running in a refinery and there's these gigantic valves mm -hmm. that they turn on and off, the foundry made the casting that held the, the valves inside. And for those of us who live yeah. In the village, I don't know if you ever remember hearing every once in a while on the days that they were poor, you'd actually hear a boom and sometimes the ground would shake. Yeah. I worked in the foundry for a couple of years. What that was from was some of these valves were, were, were in bowls that were eight feet high. And as they poured them, gas would build up. If they didn't vent them properly and light those vents as the gas came out, it would build up. And it would just explode. Yeah. And it would actually shake the entire building. What I remember about it is being in an event in the evening where your father's band played, and he'd be all spiffed up in his white shirt, but if you saw him at quarter of four, he was just covered with soot covered for the bill. And, and there was just so many. I, I mean, I, I, that picture sticks out in my, yeah. my mind. Yeah. 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 I'm not sure who owns it now. It's been for sale for a long time, and yeah. Yeah. yeah this, this place had, had some major fires, like the one in the 60s or 70s. Or? I think it, it, around 1965, I believe there was a fire there. Yeah. Uh, the storehouse is on River Street. Okay. There's a landscaping firm there, but. In the 1940s, these were built. This is where sergeants stored their, uh, their wool products, okay? They originally built them in, in the 1870s. They tore down, and these were built. Okay, next one. 1914, actually 19, they voted to build a new fire station, and that is at Cross Street, right here. It is the house directly beside the American Legion. And this one, I think 1946, Mike? 48, okay, 48 was when that was built and when the Rogers Station opened uh, in 2005, it replaced that. And Mike's son is in the process of um, making another residence. So, yeah, it's going to be a residence. And they're keeping the outside to look just like that. And I'm told they're going to open those doors. There's going to be a big party. Mike, yeah. <laughs> I was told. I don't. Nah. The Sergeant School, okay? Sergeant School. I don't see myself in here. This is a four room schoolhouse, like schoolhouse number 10, where a student store was located. That uh, was, was built, it was enlarged, okay, to be eight rooms. And interesting, Johnny Healy was pointing this out to me for those of us who went there. On this side was the entrance to the boys' basement, on that side was the entrance to the girls' basement. They're not located here, so they must have all gone in through the front door at the time. Um, and I could, you know, I could read some of the names here, okay, this is from the uh, graduating class of 1936, and there was grades one through eight at the time, and graduation from the eighth grade was a big deal, 1936. Some of the names you'd recognize from that as well, okay? All right, clubhouses, as they say, Healy's Hall. Uh, my understanding it was uh, Jay Healy who uh, owned this. Um, for some time in the early part of the 20th century, 
So it was called Haley's Hall. It eventually became the American Legion. 92 North Main Street, you've been by this little house. It was the, um, the Graniteville Social Club, actually, and they held language classes in there for the Russian immigrants. Okay, 250 houses are built throughout Abbott, Sargent, Graniteville, Forge Village, and Brookside. P. Henry Harrington was one of the busiest contractors. The residents in the district were wired for electricity beginning in 1912. And this next slide is the plan, the Lowell Electric Light Corporation. And interesting, they got the streets mixed up. They got Third Street. <laughs> Here they got Post Office Street, and this is First Street, and it should be actually reversed. Uh, but you can see, talking, and they did have electricity going through because you had the trolleys that were right up the street. So it just, I'm sure it ran the electric light there. So they, Granville's had electric lights along with Forge Village for about 100 years. Okay. okay. Abbott Wiston moved their, uh, their business uh, in 1956. They were out of business. Uh, CG Sargent's achieved a, a global operation um, and was doing very well in the 40s and the 50s. And by, the 19, um, by 1990, they were out of business as well. But they moved their operation to 31 Bridge Street. 12 North, North Main Street, they housed many different things. Um, uh, they housed fiber materials in 1975, uh, Westford Anodizing. Um, housing and Urban Development Offices were located there at one time in the early 1980s. And of course, we know uh, 12 North Main Street uh, trying to get bring people in. They have a uh, task force here in town that's working very diligently on doing that. Next slide, Dave. Okay, new construction is limited in this area due to how congested the area is. Uh, both churches have had um, renovations. World War II monuments have been set up. Uh, and about 15, almost 20 years ago, a couple of um, uh, we'll call citizens groups started uh, getting very active. Um, Grantful Pride uh, and their fearless leaders over here. I don't know what she's doing here. <laughs> Diane, that's Diane Haley. But she was the organizer, the driving force behind, and, and uh, did a lot of uh, a lot of the improvements. Is we're all located there. It's my sister-in-law. That's Dot Hall. Is Ruth Hall? Okay. Is Jimmy Van Beaver? It's Paul McMillan. Okay. All okay. So and, and and they stayed active within the area. They had the Mill Pond restoration. Um, that uh, the uh, actually the uh, group from there with the academy come out and did some work on that as well. Okay. All right. Some interesting sites in Graniteville. We talk about Graniteville, the Arch Bridge. Yeah, this the Arch Bridge was part of the Nasher and Acton Railroad. This uh, particular the Arch still stands today. Um, that the the stone came from Reed's Quarry to build that. Next one. Okay, the ball fields. You know, I can go into an entire history of this. There's a lot of it. These were a couple of the original baseball teams. Okay, that's Bobby Wall, and that's Bobby Wall, the founder of the Westwood Small Fry League. All right, this was the original field here. And this display, if you go to the museum, is the display for Noella LeDuc whose daughter I just talked to yesterday, Betsy Alveson, has been very uh, much interested in, in the history of this area. She lives in New Jersey. But that's, she was the only major leaguer ever to come out of Westford and play in the majors. She played in the Women's Baseball League, a league of our own, okay, and was quite a star, Noella LaDuke. Jeff, what's the name of that ball field there? Uh, Granifal One. No, come on. Come on. <laughs> that's the one. Well, the, that's the one that was named after me. And people say, well, why would they name a field after you? There are so many kids that play Little League Baseball, and only a few of them are really stars. Most of them aren't very good, and I represent all of those kids. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the root cellar, as I mentioned, is a picture of the root cellar. And I remember I said that Wright lived there around the, when the Sims map was made. There's a foundation located. What is the root cellar? Well, I've heard it's a root cellar. I've heard it stored um, explosives, maybe for one of the quarries, because you never wanted them on site. 
Um, I know that we, uh, the conservation, I don't know uh, if, were you on that? On the, a couple of years ago, the Conservation Trust ran a, 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 tour, a, a hike down through there. But somebody had mentioned that if you went to Poland, you would see a lot of root cellars like this. And there was a large Polish um, uh, contingency that came into the Graniteville area. So maybe that had something to do with it. Uh, Did you see the rice built there? It could have been. I don't know. On their, on their property, right? Well, the rice lived there at one time. Okay. Where is it located? Off of North Street, actually. Off of North Street. Will we do the walking tour next month? We'd be happy to take you down there and show you. Uh, there's beer cans. I don't think they're from the, that period of time. <laughs> okay. The, and I'm going to let my friend David Brody uh, tell us a little bit about the camping site. If you don't know David Brody, he's Westford's leading author and one of the New England's leading authors as well. And a great technician, believe me. I cannot compete with Jeff. Thank you. <laughs> so we think this site might be related to the Westford Knight. You know in the library there's a stone called the Boat Stone. It's on the, the ground floor there. So that stone, sort of mysterious, it was found at the intersection of Route 40 and North Street. There's the numbers 1, 8, and 4, and an arrow. It turns out that if you go to the spot where the Boat Stone was found and you pace 184 paces off into the woods, you come upon this foundation, this rectangular 40 by 32 foot it's now only one stone high. Apparently, it used to be two or three stones high. It doesn't appear in any of the local records, the land records, the tax records. We're not quite sure what it is. Um, some people in England who are sort of experts in this say that that's typically the type of thing they would have done to use as an overwinter site. They would have taken their boats and turned them over and used those as roofs. So what I've, and I've done is I found a local metal detectors club. And they're all excited to go in there. We're going to go in there this summer and try to see if there's any evidence of <laughs> any ancient exploration cool. there. Probably not, but it's worth a try. Which, uh, you know, what's interesting about this is that I, when I first read David's first book, The, uh, the Cabal of the West for Night, I read about this encampment site on North Street. And I said, grew up on North Street. What's he talking about? Is he talking about the root cellar? And he pointed to me as to where it was. So my brother Roger and I took a walk down because we used to skate in a little pond that was located right near there. Never saw it. Never saw it. It was kind of off in the woods, but it's been there for... About 500 years, Dave, right? 600. 600. 602. So, okay, add to the mystery. Oh, cool. The Lion's House, okay, the Lion's House was one of the earliest houses built in this section of town in 1717. Uh, it was, was built originally by the Wrights, but the Lion's family lived here. Uh, it was torn down, I guess, in the uh, late uh, 1990s, and there's two houses located. If you go around what we call Wyman's Corner, where it's, that sign says, welcome to Graniteville, it would have been right there down in the uh, little dirt road that goes in, which is old Groton Road. So, but they tore it down and built two houses there. There's no way of preserving it. So. Ghoul's Farm, okay. Some of you remember Ghoul's Farm. I, 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 what is the name today? Today? It's the Maker Farm today? What is Meadowbrook Farm, see? It has a lot of different names. I, that's why I call it the Ghoul Picking Farm. Yeah, yeah. Ghouls and Pickings, okay? I, I, I saw the original deed. Uh, Jack Cornell was Virtus Pickings uh, lawyer when she passed away. Um, and he, oh, she had, my God, she had, she never threw anything away, quite frankly. Uh, there were, they, uh, I don't want to go into it. But she, there was a lot of stuff that was taken. But some of the things, the important records were kept as well, the ghoul farm. So that was a large part here, the rights and the ghouls together in that area. I spent a lot of time down there as a kid also. Go ahead, next one. Uh, the Wright Alliance course as you go up Groton Road. The history of this, it, the, um, uh, this also became the, the North Graniteville Social Club met here. Uh, have I got that right, uh, Bob? North, North, North Graniteville Social Club. Just like they had one um, in uh, the old schoolhouse down in Parker Village. And they, they, if you read Bob's uh, weekly thing in the uh, Westford Wardsman, he makes reference to this an awful lot of times. Northwestford. Northwestford, correct. Okay? It became, it became, they moved it here, and it became a duplex. And my family lived on this side at one time. Okay, it was right about here. For those that know, 
that know me that my brother shot me asked me to hold the target for him so he could shoot his arrow and I lost my eye in that so right about that location so Dumb and Dumber yeah you got that right <laughs> but that's where they got the movie from <laughs> <laughs> I was four at the time. Oh, okay. I had an excuse. <laughs> Benjamin Palmer House. This is this is at the uh, where Billy Rogers lives today. But we mentioned this house because Benjamin Palmer was quarry and kind of an interesting history. I had never heard it before, but I was told that this house was actually floated down from Maine. Okay. Now, I talked to Roddy Palmer about this, and he said, "Well, there's two stories. It came from Maine." The Palmers came here in 1630, moved to Maine, did some quarrying up there. One of them, Benjamin, decided, you know, he saw a stone quarry and decided this would be a good area, so moved down here. But he says he doubts that it came all the way from Maine. It may have come from Haverhill or Lawrence, but he says the house was moved here and it wasn't built here. So, okay. All right, 4th Street. I mentioned 4th Street. This picture, this is 4th Street, okay. And this picture was taken around 1900. The block on 4th Street, and Haley's about six months ago, my parents says, you know that block? He said, it came from Fort Devens. Oh. Really? So I did some research on it, and the records we have up at the museum say, yeah, that's exactly where it, it came from. It was into four parts, yeah. I, I heard. Yeah, and brought down here, and they, 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 they need, certainly needed residences yeah. Well, and they, you know, World War I was the war, war to end all wars, so there was no need for barracks up there. So this was Fort Devon. It's now condominiums. Is that it, Dave? I think that's it. Okay, that's it. So.